The witching hour is upon us because it's week three of the Real True Facts Monster Mash. So thank you for tuning in again. My name is Anne Rice. And I am Tom Harris. Not that one. Not that one. Not that one. Hey, hey, all you fine listeners out there blew up our Instagram asking for him. So here you go. This week is all about Frankenstein's monster or just Frankenstein, depending. Um, But uh, we're really excited for this one because this is a, a biggie. This is a heavy hitter in the monster world. Yeah, and I'll just be up front. I'm a stickler for uh, semantics, so I'll, <laughs> I'm going to try and stick with Frankenstein's monster. Or, you know, it's likely that it'll just be kind of a, a show about reanimation and uh, in that kind of thing. Because, you know, as we know, Frankenstein's monster is uh, is fictional, right? It, it's it's fictional. But, you know, time and time again, uh, you know, we learn that fiction usually comes from truth, right? It does. And the book... You know, that that Frankenstein's monster comes from, um, you know, deals with reanimation. It deals with, um, I guess, the first case of artificial intelligence. We touched on that in our AI episode. So we, we are assigning organic material a consciousness, which could be a machine in itself. So... A lot of cool things that we can talk about with that. Um, Right, yeah. yeah, I think uh, we could have called the episode Ascribing Consciousness to Organic Materials. I think Frankenstein's Monster sounds better. Yeah, it's not quite as Halloween-y, right? (laughs) No, not really. You know, I'm trying to get intellectual with it. I want to impress Dr. Seymour when he comes on. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, we're I know I'm in a constant state of trying to trying to be smarter and I uh, unfortunately since uh Mary Shelley's Frankenstein uh, is a book, I did not read it. Yeah. Um but I, I'm kind of familiar. Um I don't think I've seen any of the movies, have you? I have. Yeah, I've seen all I've seen the originals. I've seen um you know, remakes, I've seen the gritty reboots, I've seen the gritty mm sexy mm. tv versions of it whoa okay yeah like people always want to make frankenstein sexy now um and uh frankenstein's monster is like a young guy i think daniel radcliffe played him in a movie so there's been a lot of adaptations about this um and uh you know gene wilder you've got the young frankenstein which is really fun too um we actually talked last week at the end of our show after the uh the microphones were turned off um, about the bride of Frankenstein too. Yes. Yes. That came up because she's one of the, um, the, the larger than life female characters. And um, I honestly don't know much about her, but uh, you know, I can only think of that white streak and the tall hair. And, but as far as her origin and uh, you know, if she was in any books or, or if it was just kind of a science fiction movie creation, I, I don't know. Yeah, and they say Bride of Frankenstein. So is it a bride for Dr. Frankenstein or is it for the monster? Uh, I know in a sexy TV show, I saw that um, Dr. Frankenstein makes a bride for the monster, but ends up falling in love with her. So there is this whole weird triangle you know, we're, uh, we, okay. we may or may not <laughs> get into, but we were talking about uh, classic female movie monsters and it, it really didn't come up. There wasn't a lot of instances. So I guess we have to give the Bride of Frankenstein her, uh, her just due because uh, she's, she's kind of the only one. <laughs> Yeah, we'll have to remember at the end of the show when we talk about uh, listener mail to put a shout out on our Instagram and for email responses to to let us know if maybe there's one we're missing, uh, a, you know, one of the, the f- a female monster for the mash. Yeah, yeah, gotta have the gotta have the mash. Um, so let's go ahead and bring in Dr. Seymour because there's a lot of questions that I have about reanimation and the validity of it. So we'll bring him up from the science bunker. Hi, Dr. Seymour. Hello, good to be here today. So this is a heavy duty one because when we say reanimation, I automatically think of Frankenstein, but it, are there other things that we should be thinking of too when we discuss topics like that? Um, well, in the, um, in, the, in the monster realm, since that's what we're kind of looking at here, yeah, Frankenstein is the... Um, the classic monster example or the, the take the non-living thing and, and bring it to life. But there's just lots of science around it that goes back hundreds of years all the way up to like currently, if we want to think, you know, we're not, we're not doing it with a lightning bolt, but um, a pacemaker or a defibrillator is really 
just our, our modern way of um, reanimating or giving some continuous animation to somebody and, and really kind of um, just the, uh, the 20th, 21st century way of what um, was imagined hundreds of years ago. Yeah. So it sounds like we're actually closer than we realize in that, you know, if uh, someone had a, you know, a condition or a heart attack a uh, hundred years ago or, or so, um, they wouldn't be brought back by a defibrillator that wasn't around. But now we just, we just bring someone back. Right. And uh, so we're close on that front. Um, but I think one thing that excites me or interests me about uh, Frankenstein's monster is that I believe is it was kind of a mix of parts, right? And it was something that was already kind of declared dead. Um, in, in, in the lab environment, um, have you, what kind of experiments are being done as far as, you know, something that's been dead and giving life back to it, or, you know, how long something can be dead before bringing it back? Um, you know, there was that film Flatliners. I don't know if you've seen it, but oh, that's kind yeah. of, a, a, you know, a ridiculous take. But in that lab environment, uh, what um, what kind of experiments are being done? Well, I, I don't want to say that we we have a large number of animals that we um, allow to expire and sit for different amounts of time, because I don't think that's what people want to hear. But maybe hypothetically, one could do that. And um, what one would be researching is, well, well, what's the, the, the essence that needs to breathe the life back into them? And with some invertebrates, with some amphibian, with some um, reptile creatures, we found that really the, the spark of life that can bring something back that has um expired anywhere from seconds to minutes and creeping up towards hours ago is an electric shock because our nerves are really just specialized um system for electric current and if we can get that sparked back again the right way the right time and uh sending the right messages then the brain um gets gets the rest of the body um going again so we have electrical impulses in our brain already. Wow. Okay. So this is, man, we really have a tendency to do this on Real True Fact, <laughs> is getting existential, right? Uh, now we're kind of getting, you know, what is life? What is alive? You know, if your brain's alive, but you can't really do anything, are you alive? And, um, and it kind of sounds almost like as long as you have all the working parts and pieces, you just need to get that. And, it, and it's turning into Frankenstein's monster, right? Just as long as you have working parts and pieces. Oh, wow. Uh, you just need that kind of electricity. And I imagine the big challenge is getting working parts and pieces because after a while uh, they bloat and, and uh, decay yeah. and, and they're no longer working. Um, correct, Dr. Seymour? Like if you left, um, uh, you know, a, a, an animal, like you said, uh, just out, it would uh, erode over time. So I don't know if maybe you freeze one. I, I don't know. I'm just trying to think of, uh, again, of these functional parts and pieces. Yeah, um, exactly. It, you, you'd want um, you'd want the pieces to be as fresh and close to life as possible. And um, we have found that you know cooling the body kind of slows that decay. Um, so that's a very helpful piece. And I guess the best metaphor here is, or, or a simple metaphor is, we don't just um, we wouldn't maybe drop a brand new battery in a Model T um, that hasn't been cared for in any way over the past hundred years and just think that new wow. battery is going to work. And then all of a sudden the car That's starts. a really good analogy. All of those pieces to be in really good condition, to be, to, to be ready to go. Mm. Um, so that when that, when that spark of the ignition happens, everything is, is prime to start. Wow. Wow. Well. Yeah, that makes so much sense when you put it that way. Uh, yeah, you wouldn't just drop a modern battery yeah. in a car that's not going that doesn't work or that you know is past functioning. So yeah. you, it's uh yeah, there's a whole picture there. That man, that's that really it, makes yeah, a lot of sense. Yeah, cuz I, I always get hung up on the Frankenstein part where they're they're sewing the body parts back together and it's a bunch of different things that they put together and then they you know, they they need a brain and it's like <sighs> 
it's not just any brain. It's got to be the right one for that body. Otherwise, when it does turn over, it, it works. So I guess it's not as random as I thought it was. Yeah, but we have found that it doesn't always need to be the original part, as long as it's one that, um, uh, for lack of a better term, is compatible oh. and is in um, quote unquote running condition. Um, then, then it's very feasible. Working order, yeah, all yeah. the parts and pieces. So, yeah, just like a, an organ transplant, uh, this is kind of yeah. you know a non living. Um, organ mass organ transplants in a way. Yeah. Um, it's just a matter of all those pieces needing to work and needing to work together. So I guess I'm way off with this artificial intelligence thing. Cause this seems like bringing life back rather than, you know, making something seem alive. It actually is. Yeah, and that's the challenge. As I said, um, once again, the bunker is not, full of animals that we hypothetically experiment sure. on, but even those non-hypothetical non-animals um, don't share all the characteristics uh, of um, intelligence and cognition that we would attribute to a human or a human-like monster to know exactly what uh, the brain's functioning in a metabolic sense. How is it functioning in a cognitive sense? That's that would be a challenge that um, would be interesting to have solved, but is, is still kind of a mystery I, from my my experience. I see. So yeah, we get kind of existential again in that. What does the brain hold the personality? You know, if you brought some uh, creature back to life, would it have the you know personality of the 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 brain that it came from, or is there a spirit involved, yeah. or is there you know, uh, yeah, that's I think uh, that almost drifts off from scientific into uh, philosophical. Um, but I guess you could you know just answer uh, ask some questions and say hey, what's your favorite car? What's your favorite color? Or your favorite food? You know, it's, oh well, pizza. Hey, that was the Jimmy in the brain. Oh, you yeah. know, pizza. You like that too? Yeah. See, now we're getting into the whole spiritual aspect of it and souls and everything. So I I might be interested to see what our guests today have to say about that. Yeah, and that's another fun aspect is uh, guests plural this week. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We got two guests today, uh, so we'll introduce them after a quick break. Um, but th Dr. Seymour, thank you for your input. Um, I guess, how's the lab today? Oh, we are doing great. Things are, I would I would have said buzzing, <laughs> but we're, we're, not, we're not dealing with bees here. But things are um, working as intended we're doing well i i do have to before we go i have oh, to yeah. ask a lot of people were curious uh, about that electron telescope i ton, oh, yeah. tons of interest and feedback uh how is that process coming that has is just it's open uh, it's opened our um our research into whole new areas um it, it, astronomy the the depths of space wasn't something we spent a lot of time with but we're getting data beyond what can be imagined and we're also um exploring the the spaces around us and in our atmosphere in a whole new way so i'll, I'll come back uh. with some, some interesting findings in the near future that that are going to be ready to oh. yeah yeah, that's exciting. That was a big part of it was uh, being able to detect the unseen. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Exciting oh, stuff. We're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Uh, we're on the verge of another Real True Facts exclusive. I can feel it. Yes, you'll be the first to know. I, I am excited to have the opportunity to, to break um, discoveries with you guys when, when the opportunity presents itself. Well, we'll let you get back to it. We won't keep uh, any more of your time here. Thank you, Dr. Seymour. We'll send you back down to the science bunker. And let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll talk to our guest today about Frankenstein's monster.
Our guests today are Dr. Allegra Fromage and Master Tori Hiddlestitch, researchers from RIT in Rochester, New York. They study treacherous acts throughout history, which sounds really cool. Let's get into it. Help us welcome uh, Dr. Allegra and Tori Hiddlestitch. Hello. Hi. Happy to be here. Thanks so much yeah. for having us. Yeah, oh, my pleasure. gosh. We have never had two uh, colleagues, I guess, as, as guests today. So we're this is a treat for us. We're absolutely delighted to be here. We've worked together for a long time, and we actually are also longtime listeners, so it's, it's really, really oh, nice wow. to be here. Great. Thanks. That's al- always great to hear. So uh, I noticed in the introduction uh, that you studied treachery, and that sounds like it really lends itself to our, our second part of uh, the, the equation here. You know, we d- discuss a lot of the science with Dr. Seymour, but uh, we were getting into some existential and philosophical type things. And, and as soon as I heard the word treachery, I thought, oh, maybe that's that leans into that. So what I mean, what you guys studied this? What, what is it? Yes. So we really take an approach to this specific topic more from like a sociological perspective. So instead Mm. of really understanding, uh, I guess, the how, we're more the why uh, and I guess a broader sense of how. So really why someone would want to reanimate a body versus how Mm. they would do it. So I guess it could go either way. (laughs) Oh, sure. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so many, so many people throughout history have uh, committed treacherous acts for one reason or another. Uh, We find, as many researchers do, that um, revenge is a big motivator in acts of treachery. Mm -hmm. And specifically in the case of Frankenstein's monster, we found a little bit of that um, was actually quite true. And we were very surprised, but we're excited to, to share our findings with you about it. Now, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. now, you mentioned revenge, but what are some other reasons why someone would reanimate a corpse? Mm, loneliness, of course, is a, quite a, a reoccurring theme. So it's either it's always something that comes from a, the absolute center of a being. It's uh, you touched upon the idea of a soul, and if there is a soul at all, it definitely these types of actions come from uh, the most intensive feelings. Nobody does it for for a hobby. No, generally, it's it's not not a hobby type thing. Um, love that's a big motivator um, oh, throughout wow, history sure. for. Reanimating a body, starting a war, um, a lot of it has to do with interpersonal relations. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Um, you know, I would say maybe the other big category would have to do with money or business. Of course. Um, you, know, <laughs> you know, there is no money without revenge. That's true. They're often hand in hand, money and revenge and love for that matter. They're a uh, the devil's mm-hmm. threesome, mm-hmm. I would say. So we're, uh-huh. we're looking at but, very um, passionate things. These are these are uh, people just very mm-hmm. motivated by passion, not really so much logic, um, but, but yeah, but rather, yeah. Um, you know, it w- they would call it the id. They're very driven by the id rather than, of course, yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. So it sounds like if supervillains were, you know, a real thing, you two would be the ones that uh, that study them and and their history. And that leads me to, you know, you mentioned your research and the way you 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 spoke about it. It sounded like Frankenstein's monster was really, you know, pretty much based on a on a true case or instance that you you uh, I don't know, had research about in the past or what uh, what does that research tell you? So based on our findings, you know, there are a lot of records that do uh, indicate that there was an actual story revolving around this idea of Frankenstein's monster. However, uh, the book itself was perhaps a little more of a cover up than a, than a true story, of course. And uh, we, we actually believe that Mary Shelley was not a real person at all. Uh, her records seem to be a little more scattered. Uh, and it seems to be that perhaps uh, Frankenstein, the doctor himself, uh, perhaps was actually writing about himself in kind of a twisted way, uh, uh. perhaps projecting his feelings. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. And um, as my colleague said, uh, we haven't been able to confirm uh, that Mary Shelley was was an actual author at the time. Mm-hmm. But um, what we did find was that there was a Dr. Frankenstein and he had been known for conducting experiments at home, but uh, something that wasn't really made clear in the book was that Dr. Frankenstein 
wasn't really an accredited doctor. Uh, he wasn't very skilled in the sciences. So the experiments that he was conducting weren't um, generally met with a lot of success. People in the village uh, in which he resided looked at him as kind of a, an outsider. He himself was very lonely. He just lived with his mother and um, he started experimenting with, um, as you mentioned, in the human body, there are electrical you know, pulses there as we speak. And that was something that interested him. And even though he didn't really understand it himself, he uh, started fooling around with it and... Uh, came so, quite, quite dangerous. Yes, interest, quite, says, quite dangerous. Know. Wow. So I know I say, it sounds like, I, it seems like I say this a lot mm-hmm. on our show on Real True Facts, but the pieces seem mm-hmm. to be falling into place. Uh, you hear about that a lot with, you know, famous writers, whether yeah. it's Shakespeare I was just or whomever, Shakespeare, that they yeah. may not... Yeah, they may not have actually mm-hmm. existed. And now, uh, you know, it makes sense that do- this Dr. Frankenstein wasn't terribly successful. So what do you do? You uh, create your success and say, oh, hey, um, you know, here's this person writing about yeah. me or uh, uh, a character like me. And yeah, and what else did Mary Shelley write? I mean, like, do we know? Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> there, I, yeah, I, I certainly can't name of name one off the top of my head i know that she like was, percy shelley allegedly yes. like well, it's a little shady on on even if he mm-hmm. existed mm-hmm. you know everyone at the time was so quick to, to to discount that a woman had written a book that they hadn't even questioned if a man had <laughs> even written it they, they didn't even that, know yeah that was it. they were they were sure. more um <laughs> blown away by the fact that a woman came up with the story rather than what the story actually was about <laughs> Caught I up know, in that's, scandal. Absolutely. That, that's kind of why uh, this, the center of the study of treachery has actually quite a lot to do with sexism in history. I mean, the biggest monster of all is man. Yeah. You know? <laughs> that's just, just a little joke. But um, uh, Okay, okay. <laughs> but we do, if we could share it with you, we do have a theory about what yes, actually please. happened. So, um, Dr. Frankenstein, who we do believe was a real person, um, the book Frankenstein, or I believe it was uh, Prometheus, the, yeah, mm-hmm. yes, yeah, modern, the modern Prometheus, modern Prometheus was written in 1818, uh, and we do believe that it was somewhere in the UK. Uh, but based on some kind of uh, breadcrumbs of, of records that we've found, it appears as if there was a man from Dr. Frankenstein's village who had left several years prior to fight in the War of 1812 in the United States mm. of America. He was uh, very well-liked in the village, this man, and someone that Dr. Frankenstein's mother uh, actually was acquainted with and was considering perhaps marrying because his father was mm-hmm. out of the picture, which probably had something to do with uh, the war. Sure, sure, <laughs> the yeah. war, yes, the war. You know, why he was experimenting and just trying to find his place. So um, everyone believed this man to be dead. You know, it was 1812. Mm. Uh, the war ended. He hadn't returned. Everybody thought he passed away. However, we have seen uh, in some correspondence from, from that period that he did return. Everyone was very surprised. And he did end up marrying Dr. Frankenstein's mother. And we think that that was a point of contention and that Dr. Frankenstein became very, uh, how would you say? Angry. Angry, uh, Mm, jealous, resentful um, Mm -hmm. of this man uh, who, you know, through no fault of his own, happened to, you know. To just fall in love with a a rather lovely woman. And perhaps the story is a bit of a projection of Dr. Frankenstein's insecurities and anger towards this man for for having courted his mother. Yeah, it seemed to him as if uh, a threat, this man, a threat, uh, had died and then come back to life and taken someone away from him. And uh, he then, I guess, decided to turn around and, and write this book and... I I would say that Frankenstein's monster is definitely an allegory for his stepfather. I I suppose so. I I mean, paired with his hobby of, 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 you know, some uh, electrical impulse uh, experimentation, it kind of seems like it was a little bit of a fantasy of his more than anything. A rich fantasy life, which is something Mm -hmm. that police often describe a serial killer as having. So who knows if he actually was. I know. Except when when, uh, the Reaper 
Oh, Jack the Ripper? Jack the Ripper. That, yes. Yeah, I believe mm-hmm. it. Is that around when he was active? So for all we know, this man could have very well been a serial killer. The turn of the century. Yeah. If he, mm-hmm. if he so we're, we're looking at the real Dr. Frankenstein. Perhaps the identity of a serial killer or Jack the Ripper, it probably it would have been around the similar time. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's so mm-hmm. fascinating. And it makes sense from a very psychological standpoint. And I know that's the area of your expertise as you study treacherous acts throughout history. Um, to to have a man who would perform reanimation exercises or, or hobbies, you know, science mm-hmm. on his own and then have this inciting incident where his mother remarries someone that they thought was dead or he was jealous of. And so he would turn mm-hmm. his attention towards him and, and, and fantasize about, about killing this man and bringing him back. It is just, uh, it, it's very, um, torrid. It, it's, it sounds more fascinating than all of the sexy reboots that Frankenstein has gotten over the years. Oh, of course. Yes. Hollywood should call us, <laughs> you know, trauma is always the best story, but, yes, but you know, it's, it's, it's never, it's not the band aid that humanity needs, as our as our studies kind of tend to trend towards. Yes, you know, it's better to reanimate love, not life, as that's, we like to say. Yes, yes, that's that's very true. So that's uh, that's what we've that's what we've found. We don't have any uh, evidence that any reanimation actually occurred in his experiments. Lots of drawings. Lots, very, lots very disturbing. Of, very weird drawings. Um, gosh, there was one that had. Part of a snake and part Disgusting. of a goat. Very yeah. weird. Hated it. And then just human hands. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So a Not snake, where they would have been if you, no, if you would have thought so. But very weird. Yeah. Very weird. Almost as if like a human being holding up hands to pretend mm-hmm. to be a moose or something. But on on a drawing. Very disturbed mm-hmm. man. Yes. Very, very yeah, strange. I believe, uh, yeah. I believe Da Vinci uh, had also had kind of an obsession with drawing hands and and mm-hmm. your your theory, it uh, you know, now that I, I've heard it, I have to say, as a man, uh, it makes total sense. Mm-hmm. You know, um, mm-hmm. you know that kind of if that kind of thing happened to me, you know, as a man, I could see, yeah, uh, creating this fictional world. I'm, I'm starting to almost empathize with the, the pain <laughs> he must have gone through, and uh, you know, creating this uh, elaborate fictional world. Uh, to compensate for uh, what he must have been going through and, uh, you know, and uh, even sensationalizing it further by creating a, a fictional fiction writer uh, to deliver the whole story. It's just just fascinating, fascinating. Oh, yeah. The further away that uh, I think this man and perhaps many people who have suffered this kind of trauma, it, the more boxes that you can put it in, the more that you can tell yourself that it's not, not your problem. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Turn your reality into something others can consume and they can pass judgment on it. And as long as he, you know, wrote this character as, as a monster, everyone who writes the book says, Oh no, what a monster. And in his head, these strangers are validating his opinion about a man that they don't even know is a real person. So it is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel empathy on a different level. I thought, I would feel it for the monster. You know, a lot of times we, uh, I know, I know you're fans of the show. So, you know, that in the past people, have, experts have come on and we've proven the existence of, of various creatures, or we, we found that a lot of times they just want to be left alone and, and live their own life. But here we, we have proof mm-hmm. of a human, you know, there are of course layers of, of, of all of this. And I'm sure that a lot of Dr. Frankenstein's studies and, and experimentation and, uh, electricity and reanimation have have perhaps fueled other investigations into that in, in the modern day, but I, I, it's quite hard to believe they had just really kind of nailed down the light bulb at that time that they would have really had the technology to kind of propel his his fascination forward. And you know, at the time, actually, uh, qu- quite quite after uh, shortly after uh, the story was written, Thomas Edison himself did adapt the story into a film, but. He, he was actually confused he, he, by, by all the flashing. He, he thought it had to do with a light bulb, and that guy just loved to steal light bulbs. So Yeah, it, yeah he, mm-hmm. would, he would do that. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I mean, I, I, I have a lot for my, my own brain to digest. I feel like now might be the time for a quick break. Yeah, uh, what yeah do you say, I agree. Um, there's a lot of historical 
events that I'm questioning now, just based upon all this. So uh, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we will speak with our guests a little bit more about Frankenstein's monster, what, what that is, what that isn't. We'll be right back. And we're back on Real True Facts this week. More Monster Mash with Dr. Fromich and Master Tori, I believe it is. And uh, we've we've uncovered some really interesting things. And that's what we love to do here on Real True Facts. And it almost sounds like Frankenstein's monster is something we it's more psychological than anything. You know, we got caught up in in the science and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, in a, uh, the, the, the literal monster. But it sounds like this guy, uh, Dr. Frankenstein, had a lot more going on, if I'm understanding correctly. Uh, you mentioned his, his tendencies as a – he might have been a serial killer or something like that. Is that – what uh, what led you to, to, to think that? Yes. Well, we did notice that the timeline for when all of this was going on did seem to sync up a little with when Jack the Ripper uh, – the you know, prolific serial killer in London was active. And we started thinking about how, what if Frankenstein's monster wasn't really a reanimated corpse, but what if Frankenstein's monster was the part of himself that he couldn't control? I know, almost like a a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde almost. Indeed. But a little more on the nose. I mean, and plus, Jack the Ripper had quite the habit of mutilating, uh, you know, I'm sorry for getting a little graphic, but his, his, his victim's bodies and... For someone who had, as we aforementioned, had a fascination with uh, dissecting the body and perhaps putting it back together, it, it lined up a little bit with, with the rest of our theories. Yes, definitely. Right. Yeah. It sounds like the timeline and the MO, which are pretty important things when it comes to, to serial killers. So now we've got, you know, Jack the mm-hmm. Ripper. And, and a they little, never found him. They never found Jack the Ripper. Yeah. And a little dash of Dr. No. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Um yeah, I, I've only heard the rumors about uh, about Jack the Ripper, so I, I'm not entirely sure what uh, what really happened there, other than some gruesome killings. Uh, and did you did you follow that at all, Jack the Ripper, when you were you know uh, doing your reading and stuff? Because you're the one who actually reads articles and books. Oh, me? And Jack- yeah, yeah. I mean, his name always comes up. It, people are very fascinated with him. You know, it's in the same lines as H.H. H. Holmes from the Chicago World's Fair. Right. It's the, it's the fascination mm-hmm. of these um, classic killers that no one really knows a ton about. And so throughout the years, they end up getting, getting romanticized uh, in, in the same way mm-hmm. that Dr. Frankenstein and, and his monster have. And I, I think back to a lot of tall tales where you have very similar stories, but they're told in fantastic ways. And so we, we discussed mm-hmm. on a previous show um, during our mail segment about um, someone had had asked us who was re- the real monster in the case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You know, who who was the real identity? Was, was uh, Mr. Hyde the fake one or was he the real one? And it, it sounds an awful lot like Dr. Frankenstein, too. So you might even have a story like that inspired by the actual life of Dr. Frankenstein and uh, the acts that he committed. Absolutely. Um, I mean, but, uh, between all of the, uh, you know, when you when you study treachery, a lot of serial killers, of course, come up because it's incredibly treacherous to take the lives of, you know, one person at all, but uh, multiple people. Uh, the, the kind of treachery and uh, trauma yeah. that just ends up being an endless cycle. Uh, and for someone who perhaps fantasized about making one person out of many, it's, it's, it's not hard to imagine that they would have kind of sewn together the idea of all of the victims into one, one being. Mm-hmm. There were a lot of things, um, without getting too graphic, uh, that investigators were never really able to explain in the Jack the Ripper cases. Um, you know, uh, various, I'll say, parts from from inside the victims were removed and placed in different places in the room, sometimes back within the body in 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 the incorrect spot, which some people thought was intentional. Some people thought it was maybe the work of somebody who was pretending to play doctor, maybe, Um, someone that had 
wanted to get into the medical field, but didn't really know what they were doing. And we thought that that was another through line in our theory uh, that would support, you know, Dr. Frankenstein being the one that was committing these acts as when he was, you know, back in his town trying to do things on his own at home. He didn't know what he was doing there either. And it stands to reason that he might have gone to the, at the time, big city of London, it's where everything was happening to show everyone what he knew. And that was the way he chose to do it. Yeah. I, I, I uh, now I remember hearing that kind of uh, a lot of theories pose that J- Jack the Ripper was a doctor. Um, and you know, they would try and pin it on different doctors, the Royal doctor mm-hmm. to the crown, you know, all this kind of stuff. But it sounds like, well, mm-hmm. you know, maybe it was a doctor who was, you know, good at some things and not at others. And that's really what Dr. Frankenstein really lines up. Um, and I don't want to go too far off topic, but in your studies of, you know, treachery overall, have you seen other kind of crossovers like this where, you know, one monster is likely, uh, you know, another monster that we hadn't previously connected, um, you know, whether it's uh, even further back in history or even more recent times? Well, and let me know if this isn't what you mean, but there are also theories that we've investigated that connect Jack the Ripper with the Black Dahlia. Okay. Hmm. Which, you know, obviously the person that committed that act was a monster too. Goes a little outside of, I think, the plausible timeline for Dr. Frankenstein having been the one to commit that. But um, I would say, and again, let me know if this is off base from, from what you're questioning, but I would say treachery begets treachery. And a great example of that would be a serial killer and then uh, a copycat killer. Are you familiar with the term? Oh, I I certainly am, yes. Sure, yeah. Okay, so throughout history, uh, I guess mm, a little more recently than what we're talking about, um, the Zodiac Killer, uh, famously cold case, never caught, um, possibly still out there. There was a slew of killings uh, around California. Uh, Zodiac Killer communicated with police. uh, And uh, not exactly at the same time, but kind of close in proximity, was another slew of killings that were at one time attributed to the Zodiac Killer, but then decided that it was not the same person. So it was just some guy Mm -hmm. who saw what was going Mm -hmm. on and said, hey, look at that. I want that too. It's just the the almost infamy Mm -hmm. of of having achieved that type of pain uh, in the public eye. Uh, I mean, uh, you can project that onto the larger than life of of the Manson murders Mm -hmm. and and how that kind of tumbled into the satanic panic in in, in many different ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, This type of of pain and treachery tends to become larger than life and it you know in the modern day you know we have tabloids but back then it 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 was a little easier for something to tumble into a little more of a fantastical idea Mm -hmm. storyline yes and i I imagine the uh the idea of fame plus uh anonymity uh is very Mm -hmm. enticing Mm -hmm. and because we're dealing with acts of passion um you know, it, it is is very uh, alluring to someone to be able to get away with something and yet have their work plastered everywhere. And I, I think in the case of Dr. Frankenstein, writing this book and, and putting it out um, with a, uh, a pseudonym, uh, you know, a ghostwriter or something, um, was mm-hmm. the way to get that notoriety. I mean, we, you know, outside of the newspapers and now modern day internet, TV, film, all those sorts of things. The concept of a copycat killer is fascinating to me because from what your research states, Dr. Frankenstein was a real person. And I know you are your researchers at, um, I I believe it is the Rochester Institute of Treachery. uh, So you're, you're just Mm -hmm. in the thick of it all the time because your researchers have you, encountered any um pushback with the um frankenstein family have you dealt with any siblings or descendants at all that um are not keen on your research 
There is still a faction of Frankensteins uh, in the UK, a little outside of London, and uh, some have resettled in Ireland. And we haven't really received pushback from them, though we have been contacted. Uh, they've been very cooperative. They've asked if, uh, if we need any assistance, if there's anything that we need, that they will, you know, they're essentially on standby for us, which I think is, is very wonderful. Um, so far, all they've really been able to provide is a general confirmation of the timeline. They've been able to confirm that there was uh, a suitor for Dr. Frankenstein's mother that was believed to be dead, that returned. Um, but beyond that, they don't have a lot of information about what happened to Dr. Frankenstein after the book was published. Um, they did mention they thought that um, some checks had been sent and cashed to Mary Shelley uh, and they were a little confused because they weren't sure you know where to forward them but they would disappear they would be cashed and they hadn't heard of you know where he went obviously this was a long time ago this is all just based on correspondence so the yeah, all you have is records yeah the, living, the living relatives aren't, aren't aren't certain but it appears as if Dr. Frankenstein after allegedly writing this book uh, kind of disappeared, which is very curious, um, and it, it's just another piece of the puzzle that could fit into our Jack the Ripper theory. He could have gone. He could have gone anywhere. And you know, in the age of twenty three and me and Sushi dot com, it's you know, I think the family is is just as interested in kind of filling in their puzzle pieces as as we are. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure it would be very exciting to have have their relative be uh, someone of importance. Uh, it, it doesn't seem there's any shame involved. I think they're they're excited and as interested as we are. Wow! Yeah, it's good to hear it has a, a more a more of a positive outcome. Um, and uh, this, you know, before we wrap things up because it's been uh, an illuminating time here this week. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about our 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 traditional question here. I was thinking that it, too. I'm like, how are we going to ask that? Right. And it's kind of, it's kind of a two part question. Our longtime listeners will know it's, uh, you know, about defense mm -hmm. and, uh, self-preservation. It's so it's almost a two part question. If you feel like you're the, uh, the object of, um, uh, like a Dr. Frankenstein uh, type um, psychopath, I don't know, for lack of a better term, their ire, if you think you're the object of their ire, first half is how would you know? And second half is, how can you protect yourself? How can you defend yourself? You know, it goes back to, uh, I don't know if the if parallels, but you know, if uh, you see a run into a bear in the woods, or do you scream and yell and get big? Do you roll on the ground? Do you play dead? You know, how does that uh, maybe translate to how do you know you're in trouble with a, a psychopath like this? And then, <laughs> yeah. you know, and then what do yeah. you, what do you do? What do you do? You know, I guess that's the, uh, almost the best aspect of one of these is that, uh, the best and worst is that uh, it's a little more common, uh, common than the traditional monster, because you know it's, as we uh, mentioned, it's 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 man, it's human, so it's uh, I guess just kind of understanding. You can go back to to you know if you if you took a psychology one hundred and one course, uh, or if you took one of the ones that we're teaching at the Rochester Institute of Treachery, mm -hmm. uh, you know you can pick up on those kind of cues. You know someone who's a little dissociative. Uh, those kind of fasc fascinations with, with the human body, yeah. uh, mm. someone who has perhaps suffered a head injury in their youth, bedwetting, the same kind of, okay. uh, the same marks that, 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 that you would otherwise notice, the same kind of red flags. So it's nice that it's a little more traditional, but a little scarier that perhaps it's something you would incur a little mm. more often. Indeed. And if, if it's a troubled use, I would say, because obviously Dr. Frankenstein's issues continued well into his adulthood um but as a child um i mean someone who hates their stepfather tell his oldest time that's not the <laughs> situation for everybody of course but this specific uh instance of you know that kind of family dynamic turned into something that has been talked about for over 100 years and i would say you know, for any children that may be listening or maybe step parents, uh, maybe you should go out and get ice cream or something. <laughs> maybe you should, you know, that's what we said. Love. Don't reanimate life. Yes. Reanimate love. Re love. Love. Make a connection with your family. Reanimate love. It's, it's the biggest, biggest thing we can drive Mini home. Mini golf. Yeah. 
<laughs> anything. It's fall. Pick a pumpkin. Oh, you could be preventing apples. death. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's Halloween. Yeah. Go to a pumpkin patch. Um, if there's none by you, just go to therapy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's yeah. year round. A year yeah. round week, holiday. Week, weekly. I love Once a, a week. Maybe twice. We love a good autumnal therapy yeah. session. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. We both are in therapy constantly in our line of work, and we recommend it for everyone. It's helped yeah. a lot. Mm-hmm. Yes. Sure, sure. Wow. Wow, uh, Dr. Allegra Fromich and Master Tori Hiddlestitch, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, blew this Frankenstein's monster thing way out of the water for us. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of mixed feelings on my part: uh, terror, relief, hope. Um, I, I'm sure those are just things that you encounter in your research all the time. So, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you. Is absolute pleasure. Thank yes. you so much for having us, and we'll keep listening. It's been us well. Wonderful. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, Real True Facts Mailbag. We're back from our final break on Real True Facts. Uh, let's open up the mailbag. Which is just uh, a question today that I have. Uh, we talked last week about um, all of your favorite classic monsters. Uh, the response on Instagram was overwhelming. We had so many, uh, f- we had so much feedback. Um, we did a poll about who your favorite monster was uh, Frankenstein's monster or Dracula. It was split 50 uh, 50. We know we're going to discuss vampires on the last week of Monster Mash, but uh, something that came up with the uh, list of all of our favorite monsters that we talked about. Uh, you guys liked the Wolfman, um, uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon, and then something interesting happened. Um, Bride of Frankenstein was brought up, uh, so was Dracula's Brides, and Banshees were brought up too, which are all really cool female monsters. But then it got us thinking about any classic female monsters throughout there, uh, throughout the years. And we were brainstorming and all the classic ones are dudes. <laughs> yeah. So we, we kind of teased this at the, the beginning of the show and, uh, you know, so now I think we'll formally request our yes. audience to, to make suggestions because yeah, all, all those, uh, female monsters that we mentioned are cool, but they feel like they're kind of accessories to male monsters, which I, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I don't like that so much. <laughs> I'm I, not a big fan, no. Yeah, and I know there have been some more modern things, um, you know, like the the ring or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, but Samara if, from the ring. Yeah, or if you, or perhaps there are some, um, you know, really strong monsters in other cultures or countries um, that are, you know, may or may not be real that we could explore, or parts of them may be real, uh, which is, is usually the, you know, the truth usually lies somewhere in between, as we always find out here on Real True Facts. So, um, yeah, I'd like to officially put that out there because, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that there's a better representation. Yes, absolutely. I mean, we have La Llorona. That was a classic one. Uh, And then we have, uh, I know we have witches, uh, which historically just ended up being women. Uh, Or or maybe there there was some famous witches, uh, Baba Yaga. Um, So we know know they're out there, but we want to hear from you. Please let us know your favorite female classic or or recent classic monsters, uh, creatures, all that good stuff. And let us know on our Instagram. That's uh, at realtruefactsgram. You can send us a message there. Um, I'll be posting that on our stories uh, so you can respond to that and just sound off. Let us know if you have any questions or stories or encounters at all that you want to share with us for uh, our subsequent weeks of Monster Mash. Please send us an email at mail at realtruefactspodcast.com and we'll read your questions on there. Yeah, I know some folks may uh, be taking a break from social media right now or maybe have just stopped entirely, which, you know, living in, in our bunkers, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes I don't, uh, you know, you run our, our, our yeah. social media, so you have to. But I, you know, uh, sometimes if I'm being honest, I s- stay away from it. So I think email, uh, again, is another great way to reach out. And then speaking of reaching out, be sure to leave a review or um, your thoughts or a rating on, you know, like a uh, Apple Podcasts or uh, Google Podcasts or Amazon or Stitcher or even YouTube. We're on just about every everywhere, um, yeah, every outlet or platform that is out there. And again, if there's one that you really like that we are not on, 
let us know. Yeah, that's a game we play with ourselves. I think we, uh, we're we on just about anywhere, but if you can find one, let us know. We'll put Real True Facts on there. You know, our job is to get the show out to you all to uh, find the truth about everything. You know, so like we always say, this is a public service. We do it for you. So the more people that listen, the more people that share, comment, uh, the better. It helps us do our job uh, the best we can, and it helps us get all of the really good stuff out to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, it helps us uh, find the, all the right true facts. Yeah, which is uh, which is the, the point of it all. Um, so yeah, sound off uh, on email or social media at Real True Facts Graham, mail at Real True Facts Podcast com. Let us know your favorite female monsters. Let us know how we're doing with Monster Mash. Um, we're having a lot of fun doing this. Halloween's uh, my favorite time of the year, so um, we are just ex- excited to get all the stuff out to you. So let us know. Uh, I think that'll be it for us today. Uh, thank you again to Dr. Seymour. Always a pleasure. And our special guest today. Thank you again to Dr. Allegra Fromich and Mr. Tori Hillstitch from RIT in Rochester. Um, they will be continuing their research. So keep an eye out for them. Um, you can learn more about them on our Instagram and more stuff about the shows as well. So even more reason to go visit there. So that'll be it for us. Thank you for tuning in for this new episode of Real True Facts. And as always, keep questioning your world because just because you hear about it or read about it doesn't mean it's true. We'll see you next time.